This episode of Outlines contains themes which some listeners may find distressing. So as always, discretion is advised. Welcome to part three of my look into the murder of Mary Bennett and the trial of her husband, Herbert John Bennett. If somehow you've managed to miss the previous two parts, I definitely suggest that you go back and listen first, because this is going to make very little sense otherwise. For those who are up to date, we begin today's episode with a previous one left off. Mary's murder has just occurred, and Herbert is in London, seeing his unsuspecting fiancé and going about life as usual. Following the murder, and with Herbert seemingly unconcerned about his wife's absence, and certainly without inclination to report it to the police, he reportedly began to dispose of some of the clothing and personal items which Mary had left at the house in Bexley Heath. Alice recalled that around that time, Herbert had produced a number of items of clothing, which he had insisted she accept as gifts. He told her that his grandfather had died, and that his cousin and her husband had left for South Africa, and would not be needing some of their clothing. At the same time, he bestowed upon her a pickaxe and shovel brooch, one which would, at trial, be proved to have been Mary's. Later, he told a similar story to others, saying that his cousin had borrowed ten pounds for her trip to Africa, and needed ten more. To more people, he said that his cousin was away on account of her health, and later, that she had died. Mary's neighbour in Bexley Heath, Lillian Langman, the woman who was looking after her dog in her absence, remembered seeing Herbert on the Wednesday after the murder. He asked her if anyone had called by, and she said no. She then saw him a second time when he reportedly broke a window to get into the house. This could have been when he removed Mary's clothes and possessions. In October... Lillian saw him one last time. He told her he was going to take the dog to Yorkshire to Mary, who had been ill but was now well enough to sit up. He told her that she sent her love. Interestingly, this mention of Yorkshire is a callback to the story Mary had told the Rudrums about her house in the county. By the 9th of October, Herbert had moved out of his lodgings on Union Street telling his landlady that he was going to William Street and not to tell his friends where he was. At trial, Mrs Pankhurst would say that during his stay in her house, Herbert had been a peaceful, quiet and orderly young man. He left, she said, because he had an argument with a man who he had sold his bike to, and he did not want this man to know where he was. This is the last we know of Herbert's movements until his arrest on Tuesday the 6th of November 1900. On arrest, he told officers, I don't know what you mean. What is it for? I've never been to Yarmouth. I've not lived with my wife since January as I found a lot of letters in her box from another man. Contrary to this, When they searched his house, police claimed to have found several items of Mary's belongings in a portmanteau. Inside, they discovered a woman's silver watch and a long gold chain necklace, both of which the Rudrums in Yarmouth recognised as having been worn by Mary in the week before her murder. In court, Chief Constable Parker, who carried out the search of the portmanteau, claimed that inside, somewhat conveniently, there were also two pearl necklaces, a receipt for the crown and anchor, a revolver, some collars marked 599, two wigs, one men's and one women's, and a fake moustache, among other things. These items are a wonderful illustration of the fact that, whether or not Herbert was guilty of his wife's murder, He was not living an honest and straightforward life. I'm Jess Carter, and this is a Patreon-exclusive episode of the Outlines podcast.
The trial of Herbert Bennett opened a great fanfare at the Old Bailey on the 26th of February 1901. Initially scheduled to have been held in Norwich, it was moved to London as the press's enthusiastic coverage guaranteed that Herbert would not receive a fair trial in Norfolk. The counsel for the prosecution was made up of Mr C.F. Gill, Mr Poyser and Mr R. Demure. For the defence, Mr Marshall Hall, Mr Thory Drew, Mr Forrest Fulton and Mr M. Labouchere. I've pieced together much of the timeline of the months before Mary's murder from the trial as it was transcribed in newspapers up and down the country. There were many witnesses and individual claims of either a spurious or trustworthy nature, though sometimes it was impossible to tell one from the other. The crux of the prosecution's case rested on a few important strands of statements and evidence. Firstly, the witnesses that placed Herbert on a train and at the Crown and Anchor on September the 22nd, and a man named John Headley, a news agent, who claimed that on Sunday the 23rd of September, he went to the station at Yarmouth for papers and saw a man who looked like Herbert Bennett standing near the third-class carriage, looking agitated. Secondly, Experts and people who knew the couple were brought in to testify on the gold chain and watch found in Herbert's house after his arrest. The prosecution claimed that this jewellery was the same as that worn by Mary in the week leading up to her murder. Produced as evidence of this was a photograph, the one taken by pop-up photographer James Coiners, which was found on the mantelpiece in her room at the Rudrums. Three different jewellery experts looked at the photo and the chain and all testified that they were not the same, although all also concluded that they could not be 100% certain. In the television show Murder, Mystery and My Family, they got in experts to examine the original photo and chain to see if they could determine whether or not the one in the photograph is the same as the one recovered from the portmanteau. Even nowadays, with modern technology, the answer is still no, you can't be sure. It appears from images as if the photo was probably a tintype, which allowed the photographer to develop and fix the image in a few minutes while the customer waited. These were widely employed up until the early 1900s, but were often used by unskilled photographers, and the results could vary wildly in quality. In the picture, the necklace looks similar in length and style to that found in Herbert's possession. But it is either a slightly different design, or the chain has blurred as the photo was taken. Remember that, back in 1900, with a photo like that, even on a summer's day, the light sensitivity of the chemicals meant that it would have taken a couple of seconds or so to shoot. Perhaps the rise and fall of Mary's breath could have been enough to cause debate. According to Mrs Cato, with whom the couple had stayed at Rossiter Road in 1899, the one who described Mary as not being in possession of a good wife's habits, Mary had owned two chains, one old and the other a cheaper imitation. The same, she said, went for the watch. When asked about the watch... Mary's father, William Clark, testified that she had received it as a gift when she was 12 years old, and even produced a receipt to back up this claim. Curiously, testimony from Chief Constable Parker, who had carried out the search of the portmanteau, revealed that the Rudrum's daughter, Alice, had accidentally seen the watch and chain on a visit to the police station, where they had been laying on his desk. Alice, he said identified them immediately as Mary's. Emma Elliston, the police constable's wife who had rented a room to the couple in 1900, told the court that Ruby would sometimes bite the watch and once broke the chain. She was shown the ones held in evidence and agreed that they were similar to those worn by Mary. She claimed that where Ruby had broken the chain, it had been tied together with a piece of cotton 
and that she could distinguish the place where it had been put back together again. In cross-examination, Edward Marshall Hall attempted to discredit Emma's evidence, some of which had ended up in the local papers, reportedly without her consent. He said to her, There has been a great deal of excitement about this case in Woolwich, to which Emma replied, I don't know. I live in Plumstead and have five children. I'm hardly ever in Woolwich. When asked how far away from her Woolwich is, she said, I don't know. And when pushed for an answer, she was reduced to tears, prompting Marshall Hall to remark, the common refuge of your sex. This pattern of sexist and dismissive remarks used to undermine witnesses as they gave, albeit anecdotal, damaging evidence, would continue throughout the trial. During the testimony of Eliza Rudram, he was heard to remark, do not trifle with me. This was a technique he obviously employed with women to undercut their statements, and perhaps to appeal to the jury, which would have been made up solely of men at the time. On a side note, women were not permitted to sit on juries in England until after 1919, and even then, there were stringent wealth requirements that they had to fulfil. As the trial moved forward, Witnesses were called to counter the prosecution's assertions that Herbert had been in Yarmouth the night that his wife was murdered. One of those who testified was the mother of Alice Meadows. She claimed that Herbert had called at her house on Sunday the 23rd of September and that he was there at around 11.30 that morning. It was, the defence stated, impossible for Herbert to have caught the first train from Yarmouth and arrived in Stepney by that time. He would have had to have been on the 7.30 train to London, and the earliest he could have arrived at Liverpool Street Station was 11.47. From there, it was another 20-minute journey, meaning that he couldn't have gotten to her house before 12.07, at the very earliest. By the fifth day of the trial, Herbert who claimed that he had been in the company of two men called Parrell and Cameron at Bose's distillery on the 22nd of September, was also claiming, against Marshall Hall's advice, that he had never been to Great Yarmouth, not that September or previously. That same day, a surprise witness was added to the defence's arsenal. This was a man by the name of Sholto Douglas, who was described as being in the fancy box trade. Sholto was a late addition to the defence's case and told the jury that the reason for this is because he had not recognised Herbert from the newspaper sketches, describing the artists as not fortunate. Sholto claimed that on the afternoon of September 22nd, he was on a long country ramble and as he walked, he was accosted by a man asking for a light for his cigarette. That man, he claimed, was Herbert Bennett. Mr Douglas told the court that the two of them walked companionably together, and that the man, who had never once mentioned the ongoing pain in his toe, told him that he had recently been to Ireland and was employed at the Woolwich Arsenal. The two of them eventually came, after about half an hour, to the Tiger Hotel in Lee Green, about four miles away from where Herbert lived, where they both had a drink, Herbert a bitter, and Sholto, spirits, and talked for about half an hour longer. He claimed that he had been trying to get rid of Herbert, and that he was about to do so when he laughed and told him there was a namesake of his who kept a shaving salon. The name of the salon was reportedly F.K. Bennett. Sholto recalled that as the two talked, he heard it announced that the omnibus was about to depart for Peckham from the Tiger Hotel, and that he heard the conductor say that it was close to 7pm. The importance of this time is that the last train to Yarmouth was at 5pm that day, and so... If the man was indeed Herbert, Sholto was providing a relatively solid alibi. When pressed on how he could be so sure of the date, 
Mr Douglas told the court that he remembered it because he had taken an order from a firm he hadn't done business with in a while and had checked back through his books. This, he believed, was bolstered by the fact that he had a habit of dating the pots he planted and he had done none that day, confirming his belief. On the sixth day of the trial, two new witnesses were produced. Again, these were last-minute additions, a tactic which I'm sure Marshall Hall was using to wrong-foot the prosecution in cross-examination and to heighten the interest of the jury. He claimed that, during the previous court session, a telegram had been received in which a man wished to know whether or not the Lowestoft police had filed any kind of report about the case and asked to be communicated with, if not. While Chief Constable Parker confirmed that they had received a report from Lowestoft, they had not inquired further into the witness's claims. The man in question was a Mr O'Driscoll, a stationer in Lowestoft, not far from Yarmouth, who brought along his assistant, William Hobery, to bolster his story. O'Driscoll told the court that on Wednesday the 26th of September 1900, at around half nine in the evening, a man had come into his shop. He described him as being tall and dark, five foot nine or five foot ten, and dressed in a dark suit with a long grey overcoat and a thick black moustache. The man was aged around 25 to 30 years old. He appeared to be an engineer and his hat was greasy, though he was, O'Driscoll claimed, a superior type of man. The gentleman, he said, was agitated and had scratches to his face which appeared to be two or three days old and a big chunk of skin was taken out of his right hand which had a piece of white paper stuck to it. He asked for a newspaper with the best report of the Yarmouth murder in it, and Mr O'Driscoll clearly recalled that one of the man's boots had been missing a shoelace, while the other, conveniently, was distinctly mohair. He told the court that, as the man read the newspaper, he appeared anxious. He trembled and groaned as he read the article. With that testimony and summaries from both sides, in which Marshall Hall spoke often of reasonable doubt. The trial was complete, and soon after, the jury retired to consider their verdict. This case is astonishing, because, despite the chain and watch being found in Herbert's possession, enough doubt was cast on whether or not they were the same as the jewellery Mary Bennett wore in Yarmouth, that in the end, the decision rested almost entirely on which eyewitnesses were to be believed. At one point during proceedings, Edward Marshall Hall addressed the jury, saying, The prisoner started handicapped by the conduct of the gutter rags sold at night for a halfpenny and imported from America. Throughout the trial, he claimed that the reporters who had so gleefully convicted Herbert Bennett before his case had even reached court had prejudiced the witnesses and jury so much so that the trial, despite its change of venue, could not be fair. Regardless of his impassioned arguments, the jury took just 40 minutes of deliberation to return the guilty verdict. As the verdict was read, cheers could be heard from around the courtroom, and when they subdued, the clerk of arraigns asked Herbert if he had anything to say as to why the sentence of death should not be passed upon him. Herbert replied with only the words, I am not guilty, sir. As the Lord Chief Justice addressed Herbert Bennett, Papers reported that deep emotion could be heard in his voice as he told him, From your career, I fear that you deliberately planned the death of this poor woman. I cannot hold out any hope for you and implore you to make peace with your maker. It was said that Herbert remained unaffected as his death sentence was passed, saying only, Thank you. 
Outside the Old Bailey, a crowd waited to hear the verdict. Women were not permitted in the court, and so among them was Alice Meadows, who had stood by Bennett even after she discovered his lies. As the boos, cries of shame and cheering erupted on learning the verdict, Alice reportedly fainted into the arms of her friends. This concludes the case of Mary Jane Bennett and her husband Herbert. What do you think? Was he guilty, or is there just not enough strong evidence to support the claim? Personally, I'm sure none of you will be surprised to learn that I'm not a supporter of capital punishment. And in this case, even if I were, the evidence certainly doesn't seem strong enough to warrant his hanging. Speaking about the trial later, as I mentioned before, Edward Marshall Hall claimed that he always believed in Herbert's innocence. He said that, despite his criminal background, Herbert was an intelligent man, and that if he were to have committed the crime, he would not have made so many errors. He highlighted in particular the fact that he chose to stay the night at the Crown and Anchor, the only place in Yarmouth where he might be recognised. Marshall Hall claimed that part of the problem was that he could never get Bennett to admit that he'd been to Yarmouth at any point, when it was quite obvious that he had been on at least two occasions. This was coupled with his obvious lack of a good alibi, if the best he could find was Sholto Douglas, who appeared genuine but had no information that could not have been found in newspapers, and whose testimony could not be corroborated. The apparent desperation of producing the newsagent in Lowestoft as his final surprise witness seems to speak volumes about the strength of his case, and the whole thing feels like one last desperate attempt to sway the jury. So, what do I think? For me, Herbert was guilty. He was the only person that could be found to have a motive for wanting his wife dead. He had just become engaged to a woman who was oblivious to his married status. And there is, after all, nothing more inconvenient than realising that you have to find a way around the fact that you were looking to start a new life, while still a wife and young child are looking for you to provide for them. Having said that, do I think there was enough evidence to convict him? No, probably not. I don't trust the convenience of the necklace and watch being found in the portmanteau, and I definitely don't trust the police not to have tampered with the witnesses and provided them with what they needed to identify and convict Herbert. If you want to, be sure to let me know what you think, either by message or in the comments. Thanks for sticking with me through this case. It turned into a bit of a longer one than I was expecting, but... I hope it was worth the wait. This episode of Outlines was researched, written, performed and produced by Jess Carter. The music was composed by Elias Hardy.